Well, good morning, everybody. We are uh, going to do the last of a particular type of, um, actually two different types of proofs today. Um, I wanted to spend just a moment going over a couple of factorial things. Most of you guys are doing a great job on the factorials, but there's some, there's some errors that we want to make sure do not continue. Um, one of the ones in, in Calc 2, this is like the biggest one I ever see. In Calc 2, I'll have people do this when they mean this. These are not equal. That's, that's a pretty egregious error. You see, this is two times n, n minus one, n minus two, three, two, one. This is two n, two n minus one, two n minus two, three, two, one. You cannot factor a scalar. That, that has no meaning mathematically. And some of us are in danger. We, we write things like that. And the other one is, <laughs> that's kind of a biggie too this is combination n choose r this is going to be an integer it might be a very large integer this is n divided by r <laughs> not exactly even a similar concept yeah there's no quotient bar here so these are two mistakes that are kind of creeping in in a few cases and i pointed out said yeah you got to make sure you're not doing that because that kind of messes everything up. So with factorials, I know a lot of you avoided, I, I, I noticed a lot of you avoided the bonus question just because it looked just ominous. Yeah, it is. It's big and beefy. But if your factorials are sound and you follow them all the way through, um, the fact is I'm saying, you know, prove this so you know it's a true statement. So if I follow everything correctly, hopefully it works out. And we're going to do a lot more with factorials. Um, Hold on one second, let me grab my, my schedule here. I had it a moment ago. Let's see, here we go. Okay. So today we are wrapping up chapter six. We have next week off. You guys have been so good, I'm giving you a week off. And then the following week, we're gonna do chapter eight. And that's really the last of any form of abstract proving for a while or really the rest of the semester. And so starting in week 10, we start the combinatorics. That's chapter nine. And we spend a tremendous amount of time on there. Yes, there are some proofs, but that's a far more algebraic kind of a chapter as opposed to an abstract uh, bunch of statements. So the last of the abstractions really are, are going to be the week after spring break. And that's also the end of the material that will be on the, the next exam. So let me set that aside. Now, today we're going to do um, some very specific types of proofs using stuff that we did last day. Now, I, I want to remind you some really, some basic things, okay? If, you know, if I said A intersect B is equal to B intersect A, you'd say, yeah, I believe that. And that we call the commutative property. Okay, great. So, so what's the big deal? Well, most of the properties that we were using, um, De Morgan's law, the distributive properties. Uh, another one, for example, if I said um, A intersect B union C, we know is equal to A intersect B union A intersect C, okay? That's called the distributive property. This is extremely important, extremely powerful, but how do we know that's true? I know we have this whole list of things that are true. In fact, we've been using these since the beginning of class. But now we can prove this using the element proof. I can say if x is an element of this, show that x ends up being an element here, and then vice versa. That's what we did last day. Last day, we didn't use any of these statements. We were proving the statements were actually true. Okay, A lot of times, we were just doing containment stuff. But in general, all of these, uh, we call them set identities, basically. Or sometimes, they're called set equivalences. The difference is we're actually using an equal sign. Um, and I'm going to go over some of the notation differences. You know, when do we use equivalents? When do we use equals? And so now what we want to do is use these to actually think of it like an algebra problem, that I want to actually simplify a quantity or demonstrate that two different set statements are, at, in fact, equal. So I'm going to go through a couple of problems. Um, there's nothing special about the problems at all. These are just exercises in manipulation. So I'm picking ones that, that actually have quite a few steps so we can demonstrate all of the different things as we go. 
So the first problem I want to do, this one is actually, uh, this, one, this one is the shorter of the two. I want to simplify the quantity A minus, make sure I wrote it down correctly, B intersect A. I want to simplify this. Now, to simplify this means I want to write it in its smallest form possible. I want to, I want to avoid things like this. A simplified answer, you know, wouldn't have, you know, something like this. That wouldn't be simplified because I know by De Morgan's law, this would be A intersect B complement. Okay, that I know that. So I wouldn't leave this as a final answer. I would reduce it to this and then perhaps even further. Okay, now before we start, let's let's look at a picture. What exactly is this? So if I go to my Venn diagram here. I want A and I want to from A remove the intersection. So if you look at the Venn diagram, my answer to this question should be the orange area, okay? Because it's just a simple case. Now, what if A and B don't intersect? Hmm. If A and B do not actually intersect, then first of all, what is B intersect A? Anybody just pull it out. If, if A and B, in other words, it is possible, there's nothing wrong with this. What if, and again, a little, I'm gonna give a little vocab here. If they do not intersect, then we say the sets are disjoint. That's the, the term we use. These intersect, these are disjoint. What is B intersect A if they're disjoint? Anybody? Just holler. Um, a? No, what is B intersect A if they're disjoint? <laughs> What's the intersection here? Zero or empty? Empty set, yeah, yeah. It's the empty set. So this answer would just be A, yes, but this quantity here would be the empty set. Oh, does that matter? Yeah, but do you have to do it in cases? It turns out you don't have to do it in cases. And this is very important because sometimes we've already seen you have to do cases. I'm not a big cases fan because it just takes longer, you know. I always start with the assumption that there may be an intersection. Then whatever answer I get should still be correct if there isn't an intersection. So. If this is empty, yes, your final answer would be A, but whatever answer I get should still be correct, even if there's no intersection, okay? So the answer I get has to work for both of these. That's not automatic and that's not obvious. So let's take this and let's just manipulate this, but it's not just the manipulation, it's also the why. And I don't expect anybody to memorize the reasons. I expect you to do a few problems and be familiar. I mean, certain things like commutativity, associativity, distributive, um, De Morgan's laws, some of these you probably are really good at. You don't even have to think about it. You've, you've just done them so many times. So the very first step, this is equal to A intersect, B intersect A, Complement. Ooh, <laughs> what the heck did I just do? Well, this is one that we showed last day, and I'll, I'll write it another way. If I said a minus b complement, I'm sorry, um, sorry, a intersect b complement, we know that's a minus b. This is the set difference law. So when I intersect a complement, it's the same as the difference. So here I have a difference, so I'm intersecting the complement. So the reason. Actually, you know what? I'm going to put this over on the left. Sorry, I got to give, give myself room for the reasons. So the first step is A intersect. Um, ah, try this one more time. A intersect, B intersect A complement, and this is called the set difference law. So we want to be familiar with this, that we don't even want that to be an issue. Okay. Now, B intersect A complement. Hmm. This would be B complement union A complement. And that is Morgan's law. Okay. 
So again, if the complement of the intersection is the union of the complements. Now I have an intersection into a union, okay? Hopefully that's one that you're somewhat familiar with. So this would be A intersect B complement union, A intersect A complement. And that of course is the distributive law. Always give the justification because if um, I've, I've always maintained this even in remedial algebra. It's a simple thing when you're taking an algebra test or you're doing an assignment, let's just let's go way back even. And you're working along through and I'll ask a student, well, how did the test go? Oh, I, I think I did really well, except there's this one problem. I'm not sure if that step was legal, but if it was, then I know I got an A on the test. I get stuff like this all the time. I'm pretty sure I got everything, uh, but there was one step that I'm not sure about. And we all have that feeling. If you did a test and there were no steps that you were unsure of, then you know you got everything right. But anytime you had a step that you go, I'm, I'm not sure if that one was valid, but if it was, you know, then I, I was cool. Well, simple reason, if you can't justify a step, it's probably not true. In an algebra through calculus sense, every step of every problem you've ever done in your entire life absolutely has to be justified. There's no such thing as I just know it's true. <laughs> no, you actually have to have a reason. Now, you're not required to write the reason down when you're solving an algebra problem. I'm using commutativity here. I'm using the additive inverse. You know, you don't have to write that down, but you have to know why it's true. Otherwise, you might just be guessing. And therefore, when people are making mistakes, well, nobody intentionally makes errors. You did that step because you thought it was the right thing. And it turns out maybe it wasn't the right thing. Yikes. So we get used to giving the reasons as we go, because otherwise, if I said this equals this, and I, I actually do want to put equals, these are actually equals. That's the correct, as opposed to equivalences. Now, can I see anything here? Yeah, that guy right there. That's the empty set. Okay, and then why is that the empty set? Well, that's called the complement law. Anytime you have a union or an intersection with your complement. Now, what if this had been a union? Ooh, anybody want to tackle that one? What if this had been a union rather than an intersection? If that was a union, that would not be the empty set. What would it be? Hmm. Everything. Everything. Good. I like that. Everything. We usually just say universal set. We write a big old capital U. Now be careful on the big old capital U. You don't make it look like you're a union symbol. <laughs> but yeah, that's that's huge. So that kind of mistake would be devastating if I got the direction wrong. Now I am unioning with nothing. I'm I'm to my set adding nothing. So that should just be a intersect B complement. And what is that called? Well, I'm, I'm unioning nothing. That's called the identity law. Now, am I done? Well, technically, I could stop here, but I can go one step further. Because A intersect the complement is A minus B. And that's called, again, the set difference law. Now, look at the final answer. Look at the original statement. Do you remember my Venn diagram? I'll, I'll reproduce it again. Is it consistent with my Venn diagram? Not that your proof has to be consistent, but if you believe that what you did was correct and accurate and you can draw a simple picture, they really do have to match. They, they really should confirm. So these are all the set, steps. The, there's no wasted step here. Everything here was completely necessary. If I don't do this in the first step, we don't have any rules for subtracting sets. We can't go any further with that. Now, let me, you know, do uh, this is A minus B minus A minus A or something, you know, no, no, there's no distributive or any identities with that. The only thing is this back and forth rule. So let me go back to my picture now, because I said there were two cases and you really want to make sure that you have convinced yourself of its truth. So let me draw the two pictures again. I'll do them side by side. I do not require anybody to ever draw a Venn diagram. I require everybody to absolutely know what Venn diagrams are and be able to interpret them because they are the simplest way to explain. When you only have two sets, 
once you have three or more sets, Venn diagrams can be a little bit trickier because of the mutual intersections. So I, I want to kind of stay away from for bigger problems. So in the first case, I said we're going to subtract out the intersection, and what is left should be my answer. Now let's see, does that work? Is the orange A with all of B removed? I believe it is. But in the second set, we said this was the empty set. So my answer should just be A. Oh my goodness, this answer is not A. Yikes. So does that mean we have a contradiction here? No. My answer is A with all of B removed. <laughs> but since no part of B was in A, removing B doesn't change anything, but it's still correct. My answer is A with all of B removed. If that had been the empty set, then A minus B would in fact be A. So why don't I say that? Because there's nothing here that states that the intersection is empty. I would have to actually know the intersection was empty to have a conclusion that's beyond this. This is a safe statement because it still applies to this. This is all of A with B removed. So there's no contradiction there, okay? But if I said this equals A, then it wouldn't work for this case. All right, so let's try another. Now we're gonna do one that's a bit longer. So I I'm gonna have to write a bit smaller. But I find this kind of stuff kind of like a game. It's, there's nothing about it that's complicated. And as long as you're keeping track, you're probably okay. So the next one, let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Ooh, this is gonna be a little bit tough. All right, I might have to write this one really small. This, I, I chose something that was really long. <laughs> now, this time I wanna actually do a proof. That one was just simplified. I wanna prove that A intersect B, oops, A intersect B, let me try to write that again. minus A intersect C is A intersect B minus C. Oh my goodness. Now I wanna start with a Venn diagram on this one because I wanna make sure that we agree. So what we start with is a situation where I have three sets and you want to make them intersect. Again, is it possible that there is no intersection? Of course, but if there, and in other words, it's possible that that's empty. It's possible that that's empty. There's nothing wrong with that, okay? But I don't start by assuming it because I'm not told that. All right, so what is it we're trying to find here? Well, I've got A intersect B. So what's A intersect B? That would be this stuff here. A intersect C. And I want the orange with the black removed. Hmm. So what does that leave me with? I want this with all of this removed. I believe that leaves me with that little teeny piece right there. Okay. Now, B intersect C. Um, what's B intersect? B intersect C, I'm running out of colors here. Okay. Uh, okay. So let me start over. We all agreed that this is what the left side is. All right. So let me start with B intersect C. That would be this. And I have A. Professor. Yes. Is it B intersect oh, C or sorry. B minus C? Thank you. I'm sorry. I've looked at Can't read my own writing. B. Sorry. Let's try that again. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> well, that no work, as my wife would say. B minus C would be all of B with C removed. So B minus C. There we go. There's B minus C. Do we all agree with that? That's B minus C. Now I want the intersection of A with B minus C. So how much of B minus C is actually in A? Hey, what do you know? It's the same piece, isn't it? Now, this is not a proof. This is proving to myself that this is actually a true statement. And I say this again, 
I do not believe it's possible to prove something is true that you don't believe is true. Now, you might be just fine with saying, you know, I'm okay with this. I, what if I wrote it down wrong? What, what if something about this, there was one step that it was written incorrectly? Are there ever typos in a textbook? Well, of course there are. Are there ever typos when you're turning in your own work? Of course there are. If any part of this was altered, it's probably not a true statement. I think it's always wise to convince yourself of the truth of something. If it's a mathematical formula, you can't, you're not going to prove it's true, but usually you say, let me, let me plug in some values just to convince myself that these numbers are actually working. Because I've done that. I'm, I'm going about to prove something. I'll just try, let me, let me just take some small numbers and plug it in. And it didn't work because I might have written the formula incorrectly. I just, I simply mistranslated it, but I convinced myself early so that I didn't make mistakes later. So now we want to do this. Now, the way you prove something is true. Okay. This is where some people have difficulty. There's, <laughs> there really is no gray area here. I want to prove this is true. So I'm either going to start with the left side and manipulate it until I get the right side, or I'm going to start with the right side and manipulate it until I get the left side. What you can never do when you're trying to prove something is first start by assuming it's true. Well, if you do that, then you're already done because it's true. <laughs> Second thing is you cannot simultaneously manipulate both sides. If you can do that, then it's very easy to take something that's false, by the way. It's extremely easy to prove things that are false if you're allowed to manipulate both sides. And then you meet in the middle. Somewhere along the line, maybe in a trig class when you're verifying identities, your instructor lets you get away with that one. That is not valid mathematically ever. You cannot manipulate both because the last thing you wrote isn't either one of the original statements. At some point, one side has to look exactly the same as the other. That's how you prove something. Because if I said, determine if this is true, you, you hate determine. Determine means it might not be, and you actually have to prove it either way, but it might not be. Yikes. But if you're asked to prove it's true, then you know it is, so you're trying to manipulate. Now, it never matters which side you start with, but we know from, from even lower level classes, generally it's easier to take the more complicated side and whittle it down than it is to take the less complicated side and beef it up. That's the way I like to think about it. So the way I've written this, I think the left side's got a little more going on than the right side. So I'm going to manipulate the left side, okay? So right off the bat, I've got a difference. So we're going to write the left side is, and I'm going to, I apologize ahead of time, I have to write a little smaller because this is going to take some space. So this is going to be A intersect B intersect A intersect C complement, okay? Now, why is that true? That is the set difference law. I'm going to abbreviate. Now, you generally do want to say the whole thing. I know it, it, it by, I'm going to say that every time, law, I'm going to say that every time. Yeah, because that's actually a theorem. You're, you're actually stating a theorem, a theorem that's easy to prove and to demonstrate, but a theorem nonetheless. Now, let's look at this guy right here. A intersects C quantity complement is a complement union C complement, and we know that's De Morgan's law. Okay, now what? Well, the next step is going to be a little bit tricky. Okay, I have thing intersecting the union. So if I said, let me use different letters of the alphabet. If I said I have D intersecting E union F, let me write it really generically. I know that's D intersect E union D intersect F. This is the distributive property, okay? I'm distributing this intersection into both of these. I've got thing intersect union. So that thing is equivalent to my D. And it's very important that we see it that way. So this is A intersect B intersect A complement union A intersect B intersect C complement. Okay, that, that just looks 
<laughs> and that just looks terrible. I know that. But at least a good thing, you know, it's intersection, 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 intersection. That definitely makes my life a little bit easier. And this would be by the distributive property. Or excuse me, the distributive law. Okay, that one's a little bit tricky. Now, I've got an A and I've got an A complement. I would really like to be able to manipulate that, but they have to be together. It's got to be A intersect, A complement, or A union, A complement together at the same time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to rearrange those guys. B intersect A, intersect A complement. And I'm not going to, uh, let's see, I'm not going to do anything with this, I don't think. No, I'm going to leave this alone. Okay, all I did was rearrange those guys. This is by the commutative law, because I commuted. Oops, can't spell, commutative. Commutative, there we go. Now I can put these guys together. B intersect, A intersect, A complement. And by the way, the outer parentheses are necessary because think in terms like order of operations. And again, I'm not touching that guy. Um, Now, when all I do is regroup, but I didn't change the order, here I changed the order, that's commutativity. Here I changed the parentheses, that's associativity. And that's just like in algebra, by the associative law. Now, finally, A intersect A complement, we know that's the empty set. So B intersect the empty set, okay? Why is that true? Anybody want to guess why, why is that one true? A intersect A complement is the empty set. What, what, what law is that? I'm pointing to it. It's the complement law. And now B intersect, oh, B intersect the empty set. Be intersected. Anything intersecting the empty set is going to be the empty set, isn't it? Anything intersecting the empty set is the empty set. So this is now empty set union, everything that's left. Now, this one is probably maybe one of, one of the two most obscure. This is called the universal bound law when I'm doing intersections and unions with the empty set, okay? Finally, empty set union with something is just the something. Okay, empty set union with the something is just the something, that's the identity law, okay? Now, finally, we can concentrate on this guy right here. Now, look at what I'm trying to get. I'm trying to get A intersect other stuff. So I kind of need the A separate from this, but it's intersection, intersection. So I can write this as A intersect, B intersect, C complement, can't I? Okay, and again, like before, that's the associative law. I think I'm gonna be able to fit this in. And then finally, B intersect C complement. I'm I'm, I want the intersection of B and the complement of C. That's equivalent to removing C altogether from B. So this would be A intersect B minus C. And again, by set difference law. Wow. Did it. And it only took one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 steps. Make sure I didn't skip any. <laughs> that was a mouthful. Okay, I could write bigger as I went here. Now, 
There's nothing about the answer that's important. It's the journey. It's the path. It's being able to understand what it is that I am allowed to do. The steps were not random. First of all, I can't do any manipulation when I have a set difference. So I've got to make it intersections and unions. And everybody here should be very comfortable with intersections and unions and compliments. Here's what I can say with certainty. Every person in this class right now should have been able to navigate through this. Coming up with the reasons, that wasn't automatic. You got your textbook, you're flipping back and forth saying, wait, why is that true? Why is that true? There's a few that are no-brainers, by the way. There are a few. Um, De Morgan's law, we should be no inside and out. Set difference law should be an easy one. Um, I used associativity and communitivity. Those should be easy. Identity and complement laws are really common, but sometimes they kind of look alike. So you got to double check that you're using the right one. Universal bound is kind of obscure. There's even one that's a little bit more obscure than that one. So this is just an exercise in manipulation, but this type of algebraic approach is extremely important in general that I can justify these because the statements themselves can be really long and involved. And if I can manipulate it, in the first case, I simplified it. If I have a long involved statement that I can manipulate and make into something shorter and simpler, I would always do that. All right, so now we're gonna change gears and we're gonna kind of look at things from a different point of view. We're going to define, in other words, a new set of operations. Yeah, this in there. Now, what we're looking at right now is something called Boolean algebra. George Boole was an algebraist who lived a long time ago, and he has a, you know things named after him. Um, the, the name is not really that critical. I mean, when you hear think terms about Boolean algebra, if you're a computer scientist, you probably have used that in your programming, maybe in your data structures. Now, folks, probably a little less. So <laughs> I want to go over some of the equivalences. When we have statements, we say... P or Q is equivalent to Q or P. P and Q are statements. They are not sets. And this is where we get a little confused. Why don't we use the same notation all the way through? P is the statement, I am going to the store. Q is the statement, I bought a new car. <laughs> <laughs> those aren't sets, those are statements. And I can take negations of statements. I can do ors and ands of statements, but they're statements. Now, in terms of the sets, what's the equivalent statement in sets? Well, that would be A union B is equal to B union A. That's the set equivalent, okay? What if I have P and Q, that's the same as Q and P, well, over here, that would be A intersect B is equal to B intersect A. Okay, that's, that's commutativity, but it's not the property, it's the statement, the equivalent statement. Now, a third one. If I said not, not P, we know that's equivalent to P. You know, I never didn't not do that thing. Well, you know, we don't really speak that way, but we understand. So over here, the equivalent would be the complement of the complement. And we call it sometimes called that the uh, double negation law. OK, so. Oh, and then lastly, I have a tautology and I have a contradiction. Over here, I used the term before I have the universal set. I have the empty set. OK, great. We, we know these. Let me I'm going to rewrite the first one. I need, a little more space. So from, from a notation standpoint, so now we're gonna introduce a new set of symbols and symbolic notation. So the equivalent A and B. Now A and B think of as sets. They could be statements, but actually think of them as sets, but it's little a and b. I'm going to define two operations. The operations are plus and times. 
I'm actually going to define algebraic operations on sets, not unions and intersections, addition and multiplication. So here, A and B are my sets. So this is A plus B is equal to B plus A, is the equivalent to an or a union, a plus sign. They are equivalent things. Whoa. A, a P and Q, Q and P. A intersect B, B intersect A. Here, A times B, B times A. That's the equivalent in this Boolean algebra. Okay, now the negation of something, we just use a little squiggle. It's the equivalent of the complement. The negation of a statement, the complement of a set. Here, it's a bar. The bar is that equivalent. So in this case here, I'm doing the complement or negation of the negation. Okay, it's crazy. All right, so you get everything so far. So far, everything makes perfect sense. Now, the tautology, that's the everything is always true, equivalent to the universal set, everything's there. The number one. <laughs> the number one is the equivalent of everything, the universal set. It's a tautology. Contradictions, never true. Empty set, there's nothing in it. Zero. Whoa. Okay. <laughs> You're going to like this. It's, it's fun. It's not automatic. It's not obvious. So I'm defining it as we go. Now, I would say the most important laws that we've had for, for sets or statements so far, I, I think most of you would agree the most important ones are the De Morgan's laws. So what is the equivalent for the De Morgan's law? Or De Morgan's laws. <clears throat> and I'm, the reason I'm doing all of them at once is so you can see the analogies, because the, the analogies are very, very clear. So De Morgan's law, first of all, if I said the complement of P and Q, the complement of P or Q, let's write those down. So this would be the equivalent of not P or not Q. This would be the equivalent of not P and not Q. We know that, okay? In terms of sets, A intersect B, complement we know is equal to a complement union b complement and changing that is the is the key um the only errors i ever see is that people forget to switch union and intersection which means the statement is actually not true we don't want to make that mistake and then here we'd have a union b complement of course is a complement intersect b complement now i'm going to write it below i'm not going to have enough room so what is the equivalent now with our new notation well, I only have two possibilities. I have a plus B, I have a times B. And the equivalent thing for complement bar, bar. So it turns out this one is a bar times B bar. This one is a bar plus B bar. And let's see if that just makes sense to us. The plus is acting like an or, it's acting like a union. I want the complement of the union or a complement of the or. So I have the complement of A, the complement of B, and I have an and. So if you look, this notation is absolutely consistent with the other notation. I'm just redefining, um, I think I'm redefining algebra. I'm saying, I'm gonna change the meaning of sum and product for you. And here's how we're defining sum and product. So it's, it's kind of kooky, it's kind of crazy, it's kind of wild, but that's what it is. So let's do a problem from beginning to end, okay? This is really the last thing of the day. The thing I love about this notation, it's so simple, and because it has an absolute direct analogy to what we already know, you really don't have to think very hard. You can almost, you can almost cheat and take the statement and rewrite it in a different form. So for example, if I said the following, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna do a problem two ways, all right? If I, I wanna do B intersect 
A union B. And what I'd like to do is simplify this all the way down. Okay, now let's use what we already know. So this is equal to B intersect A union B intersect B. Uh, I didn't leave myself any room, did I? <laughs> okay, by the distributive law. All right, now this is equal to B intersect A union what? Well, what's B intersect B? What's B intersect B, anybody? B. B, yeah. B and they, they intersect where they, where they intersect. Now, that's a tricky one. Oh, here's a term. If you've had Math 254, if you've had linear algebra, you may have seen this term used in this context. This is called the idempotent law. Oh, my God. Is that even a word? Yeah. Um, idempotent has has to do with when something's acting on itself, you get self. I'll give you an example, because um, I, I teach linear algebra. I help, I help write linear algebra books. Idempotent matrices are actually really, really important. In terms of matrix algebra, if A is an N by N matrix, we say that A is idempotent if A squared equals A. If a matrix times itself gives me back the original matrix. So for example, the zero matrix, a matrix of a square matrix of zeros when multiplied by itself is gonna give you back a zero matrix. The identity matrix when multiplied by itself will give you back an identity matrix. Turns out there's an infinite number of matrices that when multiplied by themselves will give you back the same matrix. If I had the matrix zero, one, zero, zero times zero, one, zero, zero, I'm gonna get back. 0, 1, 0, 0. So this matrix would be idempotent. So the concept of idempotent is when something's applied to itself, you get back self. That's I'm being really loose and vague on purpose because we're talking about sets and we're talking about matrices. There, there is no overlap in notation or terminology, yet the word idempotent applies pretty much the same. Now, it's not that I want you to memorize the concept, but most of you are not familiar with the word. And even if you've had linear algebra, you didn't use it very often. So intersecting with itself gives you self. That makes sense. What about B union B? Well, that also be B. And again, that would be idempotent law as well. So now what have I got? I've got B intersect A union B. Well, what I'd really like to do is in that case, um, I'm, I'm gonna mess with this a little bit. What if I wrote it this way? B intersect A union, how about, <laughs> You're going to like this one. How about B intersect the universal set? <laughs> this is kind of a crazy path I'm taking. Can I say that? Is B the same as B intersect the universal set? I mean, I mean, can I can I do that? Yeah, that's actually identity. So I'm, I'm running out of room here. That's the identity law. Oh, and now I've got this, so I can write that as B. How can I write this guy? I can write this as a union, or I'm sorry, uh, that is a union because I can write it like this. Um, a union, the universal set. Hopefully I wrote this correctly. Um, hold on, did I, did I just lose something? Hang on a minute. A. Yes, okay, I wrote that correctly. A union the universal set. That's the distributive property or the distributive law. What is a union the universal set? What is anything union the universal set? Universal set? To be the universal set. Yeah, a union the universal set, and that's the universal bound law. Uh, now, I'm taking kind of an interesting approach. And finally, B intersect the universal set. Well, that'd just be B. And again, that's the identity law. When I do unions and intersections with the universal set or unions and intersections with the empty set, that's going to give me the, that's always the identity law. So in the end, what did we just prove? That this is equal to B. Now, we're going to do this using the new cool Boolean algebra notation. 
and I'm going to show you the analogies. So before I do that, let's let's look at the Venn diagram once again. Does that result, by the way, you did not see coming, I'm guessing. All right, there's A, there's B. A union B. Do we all agree with that? Now, this is kind of an O duh at this point. All of this is A union B. Now, I want the portion of B that intersects A union B. Well, I'm pretty sure that's just. <laughs> That's just B. Oh, the portion of B that intersects A union B is in fact just B. Oh, that was kind of a, you know, you say, oh my God, that, that ended up being really simple, but it took us a lot of steps. Yeah, it did. So let's now do this from the Boolean algebra point of view. Okay, so from the Boolean algebra point of view, I'd like to do the following problem. B times A plus B, okay? B times A plus B. So the very first thing is we're gonna use the distributive property and this is actually gonna look like algebra because in algebra, wouldn't that be B times A plus B times B? Well, it turns out B times A plus B times B is correct. And again, that's the distributive law. And then that equals B times A plus just B, okay? And again, what was that called? B times B equaling B, that was called the item potent law. All right, now I'm gonna rewrite this as B times A plus B times one, because times one is like saying, you know, the intersection times, intersection with everything. One is the everything, okay? So that's the identity law. And now I can use, once again, the distributive law. Oh, from an algebra point of view, that, that is algebra. That's perfect algebra, right? There's nothing crazy and kooky about that one. This, there we go, make sure I'm spelling it correctly. Now, A plus one. Plus is union. I'm unioning with the everything. So when I union with everything, I get everything. So this is B times one. Now, that's not a typical algebra statement, but in this case, it is. I am unioning it with everything. I get everything. Okay. So when I union with everything and get everything, then that's universal bound. And now finally, B intersecting with everything is just B. And that's the identity. So if you follow along here, you go, oh, yeah, this is absolutely consistent with everything we already know. It's, it's kind of cool. It's, it's an alternate path. Um, a lot of people like this because from a notation standpoint, it's a little bit simpler. Uh, we didn't do any negations in this case, but those are Again, very clean. Um, so this is the end of this chapter. This is the end of this type of algebra, this type of mathematics. We're not gonna be doing this kind of stuff anymore. Uh, we're gonna change gears. Um, we have a week off. I would strongly urge you to be caught up before we go into our week off so you can actually take the week off. The one thing I always hate to hear when I say, you know, how was your week off? Oh, I just picked up extra shifts at work and you know worked 50 hours, or I spent every day studying. Well, I never believe that one anyway. No, you're, you're supposed to take a break. Now you might not need 12 days of breaks, but you you do need some break. You got to get your your brain some time off. You know, reduce the swelling and everything else. So um, probably a good idea. Get things done before the weekend. You know, the quizzes that are due after the break, get them done before the break. Now, there will be people who will be turning things in at three in the morning on Monday, like always, even though next week I'm not even going to check my emails. Well, okay, I might check them a couple times. Don't turn in the quizzes next week. There's no school next week. Most people don't look at things like due dates. There's nothing due next week. It's a week off. I, I say that jokingly because every time, every time there's an exam, I'll have people scrambling to turn in the quiz that isn't due until you know the next class. 
because they didn't look at the due dates. Okay, so today's lecture, this quiz is due in, today's a Wednesday, this quiz is due in 14 days, you know. You can do it now, but you can also wait and do it later on. Um, it would be wise though to, to not be behind when you come back from the break, because when you come back from the break, you know, we're in the second half of the semester. But again, I want everybody to take a meaningful break so that you are rested and refreshed. So let's stop now. Let me go ahead and.